next case set for oral argument is State of Ohio v. Jerry Puryear, case number 29155. Uh, the appellant has waived oral argument, so this morning we will just be hearing from the State of Ohio. Attorney Bremer is here for the state. Just want to point out the clock that we have in the court now. You'll have 15 minutes, but uh, you can keep track up there if you'd like. Of course, we've read the uh, briefs and are ready to proceed if you want. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, good morning. I am Brian Bremer for the uh, State of Ohio. Uh, this matter is before you on Mr. Perrier's appeal from his convictions for operating a vehicle while intoxicated and refusing to take a breathalyzer test at, with a prior refusal. Mr. Perrier raised three assignments of error in his brief. He argued that uh, his conviction was not supported by sufficient evidence, that they, the convictions were against the manifest way of the evidence, and that statements by the prosecutor in closing argument deprived him of a fair trial. Uh, his, his assignments of error are without merit and should be overruled, and his conviction should be affirmed. So much of this case um, turns on the issue of the evidence in it, and the reason is that the evidence is truly overwhelming. Uh, Mr. Perrier's intoxication, that whether or not he was driving the vehicle is not in dispute. That the, fact, the party stipulated that he had a prior refusal um, in years past um, before the trial even began. So the only question really before the, um, before the jurors in this case was whether Mr. Perrier was intoxicated. And the facts of this case indicate that he definitely was. Uh, Trooper Van Dyke was clocking vehicles on I-277 about 6 o'clock in the evening, and he saw a vehicle going 90 miles an hour down the highway. Now, that area of the highway is 60 miles an hour um, <coughs> speed limit, and so when he, he pulled out to initiate a traffic stop for someone to go in 30 miles an hour over the speed limit, and the vehicle immediately slowed. The vehicle saw him and immediately slowed down. And in fact, the vehicle slowed all the way to 30 miles an hour, which again, is on the middle of a three-lane highway where the speed limit is 60. But rather than stopping, he continued to drive for about 80 seconds. And then when he finally did come to a stop, rather than pulling over to the right-hand side of the road where there was a shoulder, he pulled his car over to the left-hand side where there wasn't one. And he ended up blocking the left lane of the highway with his vehicle, resulting in the state trooper having to then fully block the left lane of the highway to try to make sure no one got hit during this traffic stop. Trooper Van Dyke got out of his vehicle, approached Mr. Puryear's car, and he knows the odor of alcohol coming from inside. Mr. Superior had red, red bloodshot eyes. Um, there was a pack of gum in the passenger seat, and Mr. Superior was, uh, in the words of the trooper, chowing on a, stick, on a stick of gum. And the trooper said in his experience, in light of how long it took Mr. Superior to pull over, he had been, probably been searching for that gum to try to mask the odor of alcohol on his, on his person. The trooper asked Mr. Superior if he'd been drinking. Mr. Superior said yes, he had had a beer. Um, the trooper asked where he was coming from. Um, Mr. Pierce said he was trying to get home, which is not obviously not a response to that question. The Mr. Pierce, um, the the trooper asked for ID. Um, his, Mr. Pierce provided him his work ID rather than his uh, driver's license. And based on all of this, the uh, uh, trooper Van Dyke decided to remove him from the vehicle. The trooper Van Dyke actually moved Mr. Pierce's vehicle off the the roadway and then moved uh, his uh, bruiser over to the side of the road to, to, to where it's safer and performed field sobriety tests on Mr. Superior. Mr. Superior uh, had demonstrated six out of six signs of intoxication during the HGN. He uh, revealed multiple signs of intoxication during the walk and turn test and the one lane stand. Specifically, Mr. Superior walked off the line during the, uh, one, uh, the walk and turn test and he, was, he seemed not capable of listening to the instructions during the one lane stand. Despite being told repeatedly that you're going to stand, raise your leg, uh, he kept on asking, "Now, do I start walking now?" Like during during the encounter. And based on all of this, Van Dyke concluded he must be intoxicated, and he placed him under arrest. Form 2255, which is the implied consent form, and Mr. Pure refused to take a breathalyzer test. Based on all that evidence, like that was all before the jury, and we look at for sufficiency, you know. We you look at view that language favorable to the prosecution, that is almost that is overwhelming evidence of intoxication. As far as manifest weight, um, Mr. Purier really goes um, argues that the tests, um, the field sobriety tests weren't performed in compliance with the NHTSA manual. But his reasons for um, 
his reasons for uh, arguing about these really, they don't go to whether or not they were actually admissible. They go to whether or not they should be, have, what weight you should give to them. And there are issues that were raised to the jury, but the, uh, the biggest problem with all the issues raised by the superior was that they were purely speculative. And what I mean by that is that he says things like, the light from the billboard must have affected his HGN test. Well, there's no evidence in the record that it, that's true. He said, well, there must be grit from the road that affected the HGN test. Again, there's no evidence in the record that that, that happened. Um, he said that there's, uh, I had, there was a medical condition that would have affected the walk and turn and one like stand. And there's a stipulation that 10 months prior, um, Mr. Uh, Superior had torn meniscus, but that was 10 months ago. That wasn't actually on the night in question. Was there any medical documentation or evidence? There's, there's, a, there's a stipulation. That was, there's a stipulation by the parties beforehand that a doctor had diagnosed him with a torn meniscus, which again was 10 months prior to the actual I saw. So that was the only evidence about, like, but that, you know, that's a fair amount of time in between when. There was no testimony that that would have impacted his ability to do the one leg or the. Correct. That was term. Correct. There's no testimony to that fact. Uh, yeah, your argument's probably going to be that there was no prejudice by the prosecutor's direct comments on his Fifth Amendment, assertion of the Fifth Amendment, which, which what is, don't we have an obligation to sort of send a signal that, you know, this is an important right that a defendant has, to restrict the prosecutor who feels from, that he has a solid, strong case from just feeling they could comment on the defendant's exercise of his Fifth Amendment rights because it's not going to matter anyways. I, I, um, I understand uh, the issue you're describing, but I think that it's important to look at that and whenever you review comments during a closing argument, the whole argument needs to be viewed in context it, 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 as a whole. It is not, uh, comments are not supposed to be taken in the most uh, damaging way possible when they're, when they're made. And in this case, the prosecutor, um, during rebuttal, responded to comments made by the defense attorney. Do you think those comments were appropriate by the prosecutor in this case? I, I think, it, I, I would say in the best of all possible worlds, those comments would probably not get made. Um, but it's it, during the middle, you're not entitled to a perfect trial, you're entitled to a fair one. And the issue here is that the comments themselves were um, fairly innocuous. Um, they actually weren't, there was no real calling out of the fact that he didn't, um, that he was trying to hide anything, or any, uh, or Spear was um, withholding information so much as the fact that what happened during cl the closing arguments, uh, defense counsel stood up and said that we don't know a lot of information. We don't know when he ate. We don't know like when, like how many, uh, when the last drink he had was. And the prosecutor said, you know, when in rebuttal to that, someone said, you know, there was a the investigation at the very beginning of the traffic stop was brief because of the location that they found themselves in. The, the officer was, the trooper had pulled, was on the left-hand side of the road, they were exposed to traffic, they were in danger, and so he, he did not conduct his um, full investigation under the circumstances as could, have, as could have normally occurred. But then on top of that, um, the trooper did ask a question such as, where were you drinking before you came here, and he, and he didn't respond. And she said that's his right to do that, but th that's the reality. You don't get to raise the question of where, you know, where you don't, uh, how we don't know this information when the only person that would know the information is you. But that happens a lot. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, as Judge Giudosi was saying, it seems like we'd be, be opening the door to everybody saying whatever if the defense counsel gets up and closes an argument and says, we, where's the evidence? We don't have this, we don't have this, we don't have this. And if it was within the ability of the defendant to present that evidence, then according to the argument here, the prosecutor could get up and say, well, he could have provided that evidence. He could have talked to the police. He knew where he was at that night. He doesn't, a defendant doesn't have an obligation to tell police where he was that night, for instance, you know. That's, that is true. I, I'm just saying that it's, when, uh, when defense counsel raised this, this issue, this is not a this is not unsolicited uh, provocation. It's not a unsolicited remark from the prosecutor. This was a remark that was in response to something the defense counsel had said. And I understand what your the concerns. I, I, I do, but it's also it, it, again it has to do with the full context of the closing arguments and 
On top of that, though, there is overwhelming evidence that Mr. Puryear was intoxicated. And the standard is you have to show that there, but for the statement, the outcome would have been different. And also, the prosecutor is referring back to testimony that was already in the record. So my recollection, the transcript was that the prosecutor made a comment that the defendant was not allowed to refuse to answer questions. Am I, am I wrong on that? No, I, I, I apologize. I don't know exactly. I don't remember the exact phrasing of the prosecutor, so I don't want to say that's not entirely. And I may be wrong as well. Yeah, my, my recollection, though, was that they... She said that you can't um, ask all these questions and then say that you know we don't know because of it because you were the one who like stopped talking. That I think that may have been more of what was said, which again that what is in the context of the back and forth between the defense counsel and the prosecutor, not. But again, it's not to ex the extent of what it's some of the cases that relied on in this briefing, which were along the lines of them actually saying that you're hiding information, you're. Um, like kind of trying to sleep, you're trying to keep the, the truth from the jury. It was commenting more on the fact that there's no, like, the defense didn't bring up any of the, didn't put forth any of this evidence about what they're. So I guess you're saying the prosecutor, uh, when he makes a comment like that, he or she, it, it may, they may be taking a risk that some appellate court may find those comments create were prejudicial to the defendant, but in this case they weren't. I, be, I believe that there is, um, under the facts of this case, what happened here, uh, there is so much evidence about how that Mr. Pierre was intoxicated that this, this the idea, the, basically all the questions that were being raised by defense counsel in many regards were irrelevant to the actual situation. Just because Mr. Pierre was showing so, so many different signs in the video of being intoxicated, like where he couldn't follow instructions, he wasn't listening, he produced the wrong identification. He was speeding, then he went down to 30 miles an hour under the speed limit. Un um, he smelled of alcohol, it took 80 seconds to uh, pull over. He pulled over to like the dangerous side of the road where he ended up blocking traffic when he pulled over. Um, and this was despite the trooper trying to block lanes of traffic for him to actually move over to the right. There was a lot going on in this case beyond just the mere, um, the, the, this passing comment during, if during rebuttal of the close, it wasn't even like a, um, this wasn't like a centerpiece of the, of the prosecution's argument. Again, it was rebutting something that was said by the defense counsel. And under those circumstances, there's not, the, he did not demonstrate but for the prosecutorial statements, the outcome would have been different. And I would even, I would say that under the circumstances, I do think the, the same is made by the prosecutor. Um, while we may prefer they don't get made, um, they weren't, they were not necessarily improper under, under the circumstances here because of what they, the, pros the prosecutor did not imply anything about his silence other than the fact that he was the one who remained silent, which you're permitted to do. Um, and said that you know, the prosecutor was very clear that has his right to do that. And did not say you need to draw an inference from that, that you need to draw some kind of information from that. It's just the fact that when he's asking, when you're saying that we don't know this information, she said, well, the only person that had that information was him. And we don't have, and the trooper couldn't get anywhere, couldn't get that information. That's the conversation, that's what it's being commented on, not about whether or not you can use it to um, prove part of the case. It was explaining, it was explaining the, the absence of the evidence. And that is um, permitted under the case law, that you can comment on the lack of, on the lack of the evidence, especially when it's kind of being opened, doors being opened by the, property, the defense counsel. So I, I agree with the, the premise that we, you know, I understand the idea of um, spiking the football in certain circumstances, but I, I think this case is not, um, with all the evidence in this case, there is simply um, no <clears throat> realistic possibility that this affected the outcome of this trial. And, and again, and they, the, the jury could even consider the fact that Mr. Pierre said he had a beer. Um, Mr. Pierre weighs 245 pounds that came out during the trial, during the transcripts. And then he refused to take a breathalyzer test at the end, which, if you weigh 245 pounds and you only have a single beer, there is not a world in which you blow over 0.08, which would also indicate the fact that when he told said that comment, he was probably misleading the, the, the trooper. So there's a lot of evidence in this case about how intoxicated Mr. Superior was, and the jury had that before them. So this straight comment from the prosecutor did not really rise to the level of being um, reversible error. So if there's no more, if there's no further questions. Um,
the state would respectfully request that you overrule the assignments of error and affirm the decision of the Anthem School Board. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. The court will take the matter under advisement, issue a decision in due course, and mail a copy of that to counsel on the day of the decision.